Some of us could be killed. Welcome back. Hello, everybody, and good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Welcome to Connected Inc. We are super excited to be joined by the most fabulous crew behind 9B Collective. Hello, Mikey Wandy, and hello, Christina Fam. How are y'all doing? Great, great. How about yourself? Great. How about you? We are super stoked to get this started. So, I'm going to let y'all take it away, Christina. I'm going to pass this mic over to you. Thanks, y'all, everybody. We look forward to see y'all joining us in Magna Studio. Sweet. Hi, y'all. I am Christina Zambam. I am a producer with 9B Collective, the first Black-owned concept art studio. And I am so stoked to be here with y'all today. But also, thank you so much for your patience with the technical difficulties we were having. Um, Connected Inc. is taking place in so many different cities, uh, Tokyo, Beijing, Dusseldorf, Portland, all over the web. So, so going from one time zone to another, there's some technical difficulties happening. So we really appreciate your patience right now. Um, and I really want to introduce Mike Uwandi today. Um, Mike is a concept artist, he's an illustrator, he's a designer, he's an art director in the film, TV, and games industry. Um, he's also a co-founder of 9B Collective, and he is actively working towards shifting the entertainment landscape by focusing on more representation and more inclusivity as well. Uh, in addition to his work through 9B Collective, Mark, Mike, Mark, oh my God, I just called you Mark. Mike also does work in education and mentorship with Brick Foundation, the Compton Alliance, Otis School of, Otis College of Art and Design, and of course, Wacom. Some of his titles and credits include things you might've heard of, Westworld, The Mandalorian, um, and his other clients include Marvel Studios, ILM, Disney, Warner Brothers, CBS, Sony, oh my gosh, the list goes on. He's going to start blushing if I keep going on. <laughs> um, and also, The Mandalorian and Westworld were both Emmy nominated in the outstanding fantasy slash sci-fi costumes categories. Uh, beyond what Mike does for art, he also, I'm also going to call this out because you also love to rock climb, you love to explore nature, and you enjoy getting your butt kicked in pickleball. More on that later. Um, but today we want to hang out with y'all. So 
tweet or not. So hit up us, hit us up on social media at 9B Collective on Instagram, at Black Bear Uwandi on Instagram as well. And as you can see, we have a global canvas with Magma Studio here. This is the first time we've done this. So we don't know exactly how this is going to go, but there is a link to join. Um, our moderators at Wacom will let you know how to join in here. So we're going to embrace the creative chaos of Connected Ink that we have here today. Um, I'm going to quickly hand it off to Mike. Mike, do you want to say anything before we get started? No. Um, how's it going, everyone? It's nice to see you guys and meet you guys. Um, as Christina kind of mentioned, we were having some technical difficulties. Um, so my name is Mark. I mean, Mike. And we're going to be <laughs> freestyling a little bit. Um, having fun and hopefully join you guys joining in. We'll be hopping in and kind of drawing together and just kind of exploring the canvas and see what we come up with. Yeah, absolutely. And if you have any questions as well, feel free to drop them into the chat. We'll get to them as we see them. And yeah, uh, let's get started. Okay, so Mike, the theme of Connected Ink this year is the creative chaos. Yes. Um, I'm curious, like what, so in, in terms of thinking of chaos, what, what colors are your moods right now? Like maybe we can start with some, like to build a color palette there that folks can work with. I'm seeing oranges, reds, and blues. <laughs> so somehow we'll make that work from there. <laughs> Wait, I feel like you're muted. Am I? Can you hear me? Okay, there we go. Cool. Okay, yeah. I think the sound is going in and out, but um, yeah, let's get that started. Uh, so we have folks are asking if there is a link to this Magma Studio Canvas. Um, can our friends at Welcome drop that in the chat if it's not already there, please? Okay. Wait, so um, there is a link, there is a password in the chat if y'all wanna check it out. It's limited seating. I believe there are only 30 seats available and some of them are taken up by folks who are at the Welcome Experience Center in Portland. And um, obviously we are in two of those seats as well. So if you don't get a seat immediately, um, please bear with us and you will absolutely get a seat eventually. Um, and we are currently not full either. So hop on in. Uh, so to get things started too. So Mike, we've definitely done one of these talks before. So, so for those of us who joined us over at Lightbox, you'll get a pretty similar experience here. Um, but let's talk a little bit about 9B Collective. Mike, like what do you, when people are like, hey, I've heard about this 9B Collective company, what the heck do you say to them? Yeah, so um, 9B was uh, co-founded by Phil Boutte, Albus Hodge, and myself. Um, we all kind of had <clears throat> similar experiences in the industry where we realized that there's a lack of diversity. Um, and so one of the things that we really wanted to push um, into the industry and as well as these stories that are coming out where they're featuring more and more um, stories that kind of encompass um, the BIPOC community, we want to kind of shift that landscape a little bit more in adding and recognizing a lot of the BIPOC artists within the community and the industry who maybe don't get a chance, but are just as talented, if not more than um, some of the people within the industry working on these projects. Um, we noticed that the voices that needed to be heard, uh, these voices needed to be heard. Um, therefore, we were like, yo, you know, we recognize everyone has the same stories um, where they're usually the only, say, Black person working at a company um, of 200 different artists. Um, and that feeling can really oftentimes be jarring. Um, it can also be one of those things that 
uh, crush you creatively because you become monolithic. You know, a lot of the times um, when there's a problem that needs to be solved, they kind of expect you to have all the answers. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> Phil Boutte, he threw an event uh, along with Concept Art um, Association last year. And that was probably one of the largest turnouts for the drink and draw like ever. Um, and it was during Black History Month. And so with that being said, <clears throat> he noticed the issue um, and he kind of gathered the troops, um, which happened to be Aldous Hodge and myself. And we kind of joined forces to try and make this thing happen. Um, we knew that we all had a pretty decent client list um, that we could share with the community and also kind of help bolster um, and bring up up and coming artists who maybe were not getting a chance based on being recognized for their accomplishments rather than their potential. So we want to change those things and kind of show the industry that you could also creatively recruit, right? It doesn't have to be something where you meet people and you're like, oh, you've worked on this, that, and the third. Okay, now you're ready. Um, back in the day, that wasn't how things happen. And it's a new thing that's kind of been going on in the industry for the last few years. And we want to kind of shift it back um, with allowing different voices to emanate throughout the industry and create things that are a little bit different and also referential for people who come from different cultural backgrounds. Yeah, I'm also curious of those that are joining us as well. Like, where are you, where are you joining us from? Like, are some folks in the States, some folks in other countries? Um, Connected Inc. is a... 27 hour long event that started really, really early this morning. Um, so I'm sure folks are tuning in from various um, various time zones, but also just very curious where y'all are listening in from as well. So chime in in the chat. It looks like folks are still having a um, difficult time joining Magma Studio. Um, looking at Carolina's comment as well. Um, Carolina, can you just go to app.magmastudio.io slash that password that they provided above? A one R N N J S T J. Um, I think if you, from what I'm seeing on my side, if you just type that in app dot magma studio dot I, yeah, there we go. Look, there's a link there now. Um, you should join that and be able to come doodle with us. Are you drawing a person next to this creature? <laughs> I'm like, that is a cat, right? <laughs> It's a cat with a very, um, a very defined chin. <laughs> oh, it's, something's happening there. Yeah, so, Mike, That's a cool. lot of what you focus on outside of your actual, go ahead, go ahead. You wanted to say something? I don't know, I was just saying he has to have a butt chin since he has like a defined chin. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, so a lot of what you're focused on, I mean, you do, do a, a ton of awesome projects and a, a, I, we can't really talk about some of the things you've done, um, but with working on things like the Mandalorian, Westworld, different Marvel properties and stuff like that, you, one of the important things that you've also focused on a lot too is helping artists who are either students or also, or also those who are aspi aspiring to get into the industry, um, um, like you, you're focused on helping them break in. Can you talk a little bit about how for a studio like Marvel, for instance, how you actually got in? I know you've shared this story a lot before, but mm -hmm. I feel as though a lot of people also don't know it. Right. Yeah. So I would say um, it was kind of it was a long process, actually. Uh, one of the things that kind of aided in me getting in was I was always kind of 
following in the footsteps of people who I really favored who worked at Marvel already. So I would take classes with um, other teachers from Marvel, um, things of that nature. I'm eventually putting my work next to those artists as well and kind of gauging if I was ready or not, right? Um, eventually what would happen is I got into the industry and I kind of had a plan. Um, <clears throat> kind of had a plan where I was like, okay, cool. Like I work on these big projects, things of that nature. Um, but eventually in hopes I would get into being in the studio that I want to, um, which is Marvel. Um, so I would go to every event, whether it was uh, Comic-Con, um, Comic-Con, WonderCon, uh, every con, <laughs> um, Lightbox, all the things. And eventually, you know, I'll show my work to people at Marvel, um, things of that nature. But I really was fortunate when I showed my work to Anthony Francisco and I was just simply starting up a conversation and he mentioned like, hey, can I see what you have? Um, show him what I have. And he was like, yo, this stuff is pretty close to being, um, you know, Marvel level. And I was like, oh, that's really nice. Um, eventually I kind of, you know, got his number in passing and stuff like that. But, you know, I was never like, like, I would say, I was never really like expecting anything, right? It was just like a conversation. He liked my stuff and that was cool. Well, eventually um, what would happen is I kind of was fortunate when a CDA class that I put a lot of effort into uh, called me back and asked for me to um, come and speak to the class and boom, Anthony Francisco was there again. <laughs> Um, this was probably like about a year and a half, two years later, <clears throat> and I already had a few projects under my belt, um, and he was like, yo, I think that you're ready, um, and he eventually recommended me um, into Marvel and been working there ever since um, for the last like two and a half years, roughly, and um, been loving it. It's been a really awesome experience, been challenging to say the least, um, and I mean that in the best possible way. Um, but yeah, it's been a real journey. And I think that one of the big things that I recognized along that journey was just simply getting into the industry was not easy. Um, and also kind of recognizing that if it took me this long, I can only imagine how many <laughs> other artists, um, would have more trouble figuring it out than actually doing the art itself. Um, so I kind of wanted to eventually get back so no one would ever kind of go through what I went through because that was a really long process simply getting into the industry as a whole. Um, super elusive, asking all the questions and, you know, the thing that I think comes from that, um, the dangerous thing I think that comes from that is you eventually get tired, right? And you're like, yo, I don't know, maybe it's just not meant for me. Um, and I think a lot of people kind of go through that ultimately. So that in itself, you end up missing out on a lot of amazing talent um, based on the frustrations of not getting into the industry when the fire is running high. Um, so that's something that I wanted to aid in fixing um, with the industry as a whole, um, especially just noticing that you can see people's work and see the potential and see where they're going. Um, I think just noticing those things and trying to make a change in that way, it's kind of just been a passion of mine in general. Yeah. I mean, when you're talking about, I'm going to stop drawing for a second. It's hard to doodle and talk at the same time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you do, but when you talk about getting into the industry and taking different classes, I know that when you've done talks in the past too, some of the questions that have also come up were like, hey, I'm interested in being an artist. Like what classes do I even take? Because for one, if you look at art schools, um, like such as a place like Otis or Art Center, it's super expensive and it's not always accessible, usually not accessible for those, for most people. So when there are aspiring artists out there where do they start? Like, what are some of those fundamental classes and courses that you recommend? Yeah, so I very much treat my education as well as life like an RPG. <laughs> um, so as you know, um, so 
oftentimes I will recognize which one of the flashy classes and which ones are the foundational classes. And I won't take certain classes until I know that I've done the things that lead um, that will kind of add to my understanding of said subject. So for example, um, basic classes, of course, are things like uh, perspective, um, anatomy, um, figure drawing, uh, color and light even, uh, things of that nature. Um, and I would take all of those things before jumping into something like digital painting, right? And the reason why is because without that foundation, um, things get a re get really, really rough. It's really hard to jump all the way to the fun stuff and then go backwards to do the quote unquote boring stuff. Um, and so recognizing that, I think it takes a certain level of discipline um, in which that's what I try to instill for myself. And I would kind of properly prep myself before each class. So if I was going to take a costume class, for example, <clears throat> I wouldn't dare take a costume class without taking an anatomy class and really trying to understand it uh, to the core, just because you want to be the best you can be for each class. Um, you don't want to like jump into a class and know nothing of the things that come before it. Um, so I would kind of structure my education that way um, and making sure that I'm getting the most out of each class and the most out of each educational um, component that I can. Um, for example, <clears throat> there's certain terminology that would be used during these classes where they expect you to already kind of know it. And if you don't, then you're almost having to do double the work, um, which could eventually waste your time. So <clears throat> that's how I oftentimes treated my education. Um, and of those, of those more basic classes, the fundamentals that you speak of too, what sort of order would you recommend? Because that could be for someone who who isn't going to art school is maybe going to maybe is working and trying to take art classes at the same time. What sort of order should they take it in? Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, I think definitely it depends if you're taking one class at a time or if you're taking like four classes at a time. Um, but <clears throat> I think the essentials are perspective for sure, which is like math for artists, depending on what you do. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm seeing Ra uh, Reggie in here. What's up, Reggie? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I would take perspective for sure, um, because that's one of those classes that are just monumental, whether you're doing character or environment or vehicles. Um, definitely do foundational drawing, like, uh, like anatomy, figure drawing, things of that nature. Um, and the reason why is because figure drawing is one of those things that doesn't just teach you how to draw the human figure, but it also is applicable to design. Um, and the faster you get to nail down that figure, the less time and effort you're putting into actually putting into your design. So that's one of those things that I would definitely recommend um, those two. Eventually, <clears throat> I would even do things like animal anatomy um, to further inform your ability to understand human anatomy. <clears throat> and just in case you want to do something like creature design or whatever. Um, and then I would eventually jump into things like uh, painting. Traditionally, personally, um, I think that that always works out better. I've seen a lot of amazing artists who have learned how to paint traditionally, and then you throw them a Wacom pen, and yeah, the, the beginning is a little rough, but they eventually really fall in love and push um, the digital format so easily because they understand um, certain things. I think the best part about working with uh, traditional medium is that you learn so much with limitation, and digital, formats oftentimes provide you with too much. So what ends up happening is people get lost in the program, whereas because they don't have a foundation, um, they get lost in the program and they're seeing too much information. Um, it gets really easy to learn how to do things when you have next to no information whatsoever. So I really personally think that those classes are 
just really big uh, for me, in my opinion, to start off with. Okay. And if people had checked out your bio before joining or are checking it out right now, they will know that you work, you have, you been doing art for a very long time, but in an official capacity with your career, it's been several years or so, I forget at this point. However, you used to be a pre-med student. Yes, yes. Yeah. Talk about <laughs> that journey, please. How yeah. did you make that jump? Why did you make that jump? Well, I was really fortunate. <laughs> um, I think that one is more of a cultural thing than anything else. Uh, I initially started off, yes, like she said, uh, doing med school and things like that. Um, Pre-med, sorry. And my dad, who is Nigerian, was like, yo, I want you to be a doctor. <laughs> so I took into that and felt like, oh, OK, yeah, it's not a bad you know, career. I did enjoy just kind of studying the human body and things of that nature. So I was like, all right, cool. Like, let me jump into that. And because I had been drawing almost my whole life, um, my mom <laughs> kind of jumped in and was like, you're making a grave mistake. And kind of just informed me that like, she wanted me to go back into art school um, or jump into art as a career. Um, but also I had a bunch of different people such as Reggie who's in here, Rockmo is the name that you see, um, Brandon, uh, Wayne, who was another one. And most of all, a uh, long, uh, a friend who I grew up with my whole life, who right before he died also mentioned like, yeah, you should get back into art. Um, cause I stopped for about nine years. Um, never, I stopped drawing, but I never stopped consuming art in different ways though. Um, so eventually I did a thing where I was like, let me just apply to two, to two different um, schools at the same time. And I applied to um, an art school and I applied to um, pre uh, school to continue my pre-med education. And I was like, whatever one takes me first is the one that I'm going to jump into. And so our school took me, I went to go and check it out and I loved it. And just kind of never looked back. That is pretty beautiful. Um, I think a lot of the, I'm sure you'll echo the sentiment where like a lot of it is, I mean, you wanting to pursue art, but also the people that you surrounded yourself with who helped push you and continue push, to push you on that journey as well. Yeah, definitely. No, I must say, I think I have like, <laughs> I say this a lot, but I really mean it. I think I have like the dopest friends like ever. Um, I've been really fortunate to be surrounded by like some awesome, awesome people, including yourself. Um, and yeah, I feel like uh, just as I'm able to tell my friends the truth, they're definitely able to tell me the truth too. So it's been really kind of a blessing overall to kind of just be surrounded with uh, the people who I have who kind of have my back and just kind of pushed me in the direction that they knew I would be happiest, you know? Hell yeah, man. Um, the, I feel as though it's really important to, we can go on and on about this, but especially whether in work or in, in career or in your personal life too, you definitely want people who call you out on, call you out on those, those things that call you out on the bullshit pretty much. Yeah. I'm like, can I curse? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So when you when you find that, you certainly want to want to hold on to it for sure. Definitely. Um, I do want to. I'm gonna change gears and take it back to 9B very quickly as well. Um, a lot of the a lot of people, first off, if you're interested in learning more about 9B, uh, you can hit up our social media on Instagram, so at 9B Collective. And if you check out the link we have in our bio, you can click that and you'll see a link to fill out a form. And that's how you would stay in touch to learn about 
what 90s up to, what events we might have going on. Um, our company itself, our team is based out in Los Angeles. However, our we have a global community of artists. Um, so we have folks in the States, obviously. We also have folks over in Europe and Africa and South America. So it's we welcome the global community. So if you want to stay in touch, that's how you'll stay in touch. Um, but more importantly, too, when people are wondering about 9B Collective and getting involved in an artist capacity, like what does 9B look for? When yeah. Go out and when, what, what does 9B look for in a potential artist? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think there's a few, there's quite a few things, but I think the most common things are um, looking at their skill set, um, seeing how much um, room there is for them to grow, um, whether it is, are they in need of mentorship or they need in need of work, um, looking at their style that they're showcasing. Um, but also, I think one of the most underrated things is looking at their personality. <laughs> Looking at the personality, um, and that's something that I feel like isn't talked about enough, is a lot of times when it comes to work, uh, you don't want to work or even art direct someone who is overly difficult. Um, and it's all about how you present yourself, you know, you present yourself professionally um, oftentimes. And so that is probably one of the biggest things. Um, some people may not be fully there yet um, as far as their skill set but if their personality is dope you almost want to like help them you know you almost want to help educate them if you can or give them some tips and eventually see them succeed you know so i think that that's one of the biggest things that we look for is that tenacity um perseverance and also just kind of noticing uh the growth right? Um, when it comes to their work. Um, Sometimes people are in a place where artists are in a place where they need to continue drawing. Um, and then sometimes people are in a place where they're probably stuck in a rut and they just need someone to kind of point out the things that are missing um, from their portfolios. Um, so I think that those are probably the main things that we look for um, when it comes to get, getting working artists. Whoa, what was that? <laughs> That wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever just happened, whoever just did that looks not too shabby. Looks good. Um, no, I do want to let's let's definitely talk about that because I, I want you to dig in a little more from an art direction, an art director's perspective, and from like concept artist perspective there. Um, the first part is when you talk about being a difficult person, for instance. Um, I think it's very easy for people to picture what that might look like, what, what that is, or experience based off of their own um, perspectives. But for you, like when you are working with someone, what, like, you're like, what, what are those flags for you, for instance? Right. Um, so <laughs> I used to have quite a few things. And I think that I've learned a lot of like cool lessons through working um, my way up and stuff like that. So like, for example, um, if you have an art director and he's giving you notes, right? And he's like, oh, like I need to see this and you see that. Um, oftentimes it's probably not the best place to challenge your art director. Um, there's different ways of going about challenging without verbally, you know, <laughs> trying to back him into a corner, so to speak. Um, I think one of the good ways or smarter ways is if you're going to challenge your art director, maybe you don't agree with the decision, maybe just simply doing what he or she is asking, but then also doing a version that you think um, may kind of bode over well. Um, kind of taking note, turning in assignments on time <laughs> is like really important as well. You know, like I think a lot of times that might be just a, Oh, I'm glad that Reggie is drawing this for you right here <laughs> next to my kin. Um, <laughs> but, um, a lot of the times, like, I think a lot of artists, especially newer artists, don't understand the pipeline. So they'll kind of do what they want to do 
and kind of leave it there. And it's like, yo, you guys don't understand the pipeline of what the art director is looking for and what's the next steps, right? So if you see it as just turning in the finished picture, you're not seeing the uh, artist, art director needing to present those ideas in a meeting and compile them and put them together in a, at a, by a certain timeline, things of that nature. Um, I think those are some of the bigger issues. Sorry, my stuff is freezing up. Um, those are some of the bigger issues that I've seen that really need to kind of, goodness, what is happening? Um, some of the bigger issues that needs to kind of be addressed. Um, also, I think another one is, uh, I kind of want to talk about the turning in work on time and kind of asking questions. Um, I know a lot of newer artists, especially they're afraid to ask questions, um, for the fear of looking foolish or you know, whatever, but oftentimes you look a lot more foolish if you don't ask the proper questions and turning in your work and it's in the wrong direction. Um, you know, sometimes our directors will have check-ins and you're like, hey, can you show me where your work is? And a lot of the times uh, concept artists will be like, oh, well, I'm gonna turn it in when I'm ready. It's like, well, once again, being considerate of your art director's time is also another thing that's really important. Um, so I think a lot of it comes down to kind of simple manners, you know, um, but a lot of times those things go ignored in the industry. No, 100% agreed. Um, I will, I'll speak to this from, um, my own experiences as a producer. So just for a little bit of context, um, I, I'm a producer in the games industry um, and at 9B Collective. So on the 9B side, I focus on social media and other forms of content production for the studio. And on in the games industry, I work on a console game. Um, so yeah, speaking to that too, like if you are a, if, you're a super dope person and you've got potential as an artist, people will absolutely invest in you if you are putting in the work and having those and, and being very tactful about how you're approaching putting in the work. Um, but at the same time, if you're a baller artist, but you are a straight up jerk and are just rude and disrespectful about how you carry yourself or treat others around you for that matter, um, you will not get work with at least people like myself or Mike, um, just straight up. Um, and I think in speaking with deadlines and understanding production pipelines as well, it's like, there are people, there are absolutely people there, or we would hope that there are people there who help you understand what pipelines and um, and like production, what what production pipelines that you're working in. And if there aren't, if there aren't, that's another issue. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like how you approach asking people for help actually matters and people want to be, it's okay to make mistakes for starters. Absolutely. It's okay to make mistakes, but how you receive feedback is so huge. And yeah. speaking to you about that too, Mike, like, it's like, you don't have to agree with someone's feedback necessarily, but they want to feel as if you're listening to them. And when I say listening, it's not just hearing them, but actually actively hearing them and internalizing what they have to say beyond what they're just speaking. Cause it might be said in a certain tone um, or a certain manner, but there is usually more to it than what you are hearing on the surface level. Um, and being able to understand those nuances is pretty important. Um, yeah, and we deal with that a lot working in productions. Definitely agree with that. Can't agree more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and also, I want to go back to to um 9b as well like a lot of what people do submit their portfolios first off total disclaimer please do not submit your portfolios via instagram we don't look at them that way um 
If you are interested in having your portfolio looked at, please submit them through the form. Um, our team is figuring out in the process of figuring out how we can look at more portfolios sometime in the near future. Um, but we want to work with people who want to work with us for starters. Um, so if you are interested in getting your portfolio looked at eventually, um, please submit them through, through the 9B form. I always have to just say that because people are, people, there are prospects, prospective artists who are interested and then they'll just reach out and be like, hey, how do I work with y'all? It's like, well, if we're, you're wanting to apply to an art studio, then like, please send your portfolio. Um, I think that's extremely important. And including putting your best work forward, for sure. Yeah, that's super important. I think um, stretch, knowing how to structure your portfolio is really important as yeah. well. Talk about some of that. Yeah, um, so I would say, sorry, one second. Um, I would say like structuring your portfolio is so dang important. Like, uh, and I think that there's multiple ways to learn. For one, you can ask, of course, right? You can ask like another opinion, um, another friend. Like, I remember I had, uh, you remember Chris? Um, yeah. Chris Zinti was like one of the first people where I was like, yo, can you look at my portfolio? And it's funny because he was more of a 3D artist at the time, but he had a really good eye for just, good stuff um and so i remember showing him <laughs> my portfolio and he told me like take this out take that out take this out take this out it was like more than half of my work <laughs> right and up until that point i remember i was trying to get certain jobs and wasn't getting them and i was like okay cool and i took out some of them because i didn't want to kill my darlings and i showed it to another big company and I luckily got to talk to the art director. He told me to take out and restructure the exact same way Chris told me to restructure it. And I was like, damn, all right. So it was funny that once I did that, the work started just kind of rolling in. And I was like, that is insane, but it's something to notice. Like, I think one of the easiest ways to really learn how to do it for yourself instead of depending on someone else's eye is going to live workshops where you get to meet people in person. Um, I've gone to no live, probably hundreds. Um, and I would show my portfolio, I would show my work and I would be looking at the person reviewing my portfolio, whether a student or um, professional artist. And I would look at their reactions and I would kind of gauge like, oh, they reacted really well here, but their attention dropped off after three or four pieces. Um, so you'll see, some of the most important things is um, noticing how to keep the attention of your viewer, um, which images are impactful and which ones to let go, and why it's important to keep your portfolio short and sweet as opposed to showing everything in the world that you can do. Um, sometimes that doesn't really help you. Um, and so eventually I think learning some of those skills from kind of showing my portfolio over and over, I start to curate my portfolio in a way that I knew would work every single time. Um, one is strong, starting off with your strongest pieces. Um, sometime it could be possibly your flashiest piece, right? And then kind of almost gray dating towards the middle of not so impressive visually but maybe it's showcasing something else like your informational understanding of design things of that nature and then you want to end it um you want to end the portfolio with something strong as well so it's very much like a movie first act second act third act you definitely want to catch their eye in the very beginning and keep their attention and then right before that third act is about to kick up and boom you hit them with a cliffhanger and then you end it really well um, and that's how you kind of keep it uh, cohesive and interesting for your viewer. So I just will say, keep it like a movie. Um, yeah, I, I want to die. I want to talk about that too. Like we've had conversations about you roasting portfolios. Um, so, <laughs> so I want I want to break it down a bit because we might have. I want to break it down a bit so that folks in the audience understand what you look for 
hey, when you're looking at a junior artist, how do you go about roasting their portfolio versus a mid-level versus like someone who's super seasoned? What are those nuances that you look for from someone who's more entry level to, you know, I've been in the game for a long ass time? Yeah, um, those are good questions. So I think when it comes to, sorry, I'm like really not drawing too much because all these questions are so good. Um, (laughs) But uh, when it comes to portfolios, I think, you can really see where someone is at and you can also see through the tricks when you've been through the industry quite a few times. Um, there's certain tricks that are used often, like let me do something extremely flashy, but it's not well thought out. Right. Um, and sometimes the technical skill will be there, but the design skill will not match up. Um, and so that's something that I look at a lot is like, how well can you design? How great are your ideas? Um, and that's something across the board. Because there's professionals who are really good, but don't have the most amazing design skills. And then there's also some really early beginners who have amazing ideas, but maybe their technical prowess isn't matching up quite as much. Um, also, Reggie is on fire right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, Reggie's filling up this whole canvas over here. Um, Gosh. Everyone is. Um, mm-hmm. And so some of the things I look for is, uh, for one, consistency. Um, and I think that that's a big difference between people who are really well seasoned and people who maybe are not. Um, it's kind of like looking at someone's work, you'll see that level of consistency over and over again. And that's how you kind of indicate professionalism. Whereas someone who is less experienced, you will see the skill jumping all over the place throughout the portfolio. Um, And you'll notice that that lack of consistency isn't really selling them too well. Um, And that's when oftentimes you'll have someone kind of curate like, hey, like maybe you should take this thing out. Maybe you should take that out. Um, When it comes to making someone like, say, a senior, you're looking for not only the consistency, not only the experience, but also um, if it's indicating them specializing in something, you know, like, are you a character designer? Are you an environment um, concept artist? Like, what are you? And how far are you diving into your identity? Um, Whereas with someone who is kind of brand new to the game, um, they may have, their portfolio may be a little bit more varied, but you kind of have a chance, kind of have a chance to kind of see like, oh yeah, you do a little bit of everything, but you're really, really good at this thing here. Um, And making sure that even within that, there's a consistency level Um, and a certain, there does have to be a certain skill that is being achieved um to even be you know considered um because oftentimes when we're looking at portfolios we want to know where can we put you um like where where can we use you you know we sometimes people will post or have a lot of work that's different genres and cool and that's dope right but you almost want to brand yourself a little bit um so when they think of you they think of that thing so if they're like oh yeah that person they're the medieval you know, character designer, you immediately think of them, right? And so if something like a fantasy project comes up, you know exactly, you're like, oh yeah, there was that one guy who you can put into that project or one girl who does the cool sci-fi environments. Like you kind of want to look at it like that Um, because I think a lot of times people want to showcase what they're capable of, but they're not showcasing what they really enjoy. And that's kind of a big deal when it comes to working because, you know, some of these projects could be long. They could be like six months, seven months, a few years, <laughs> three years. I think we work together like things like that. And you want to make sure that that person really enjoys what the hell they're doing. So they're not suffering <laughs> through it or losing interest midway through the project. Right. Um, so those are something, some of the things that I know I look for um, specifically. Um, also, I must say, there's a lot of people who want to be character designers and they only draw the face. You can't <laughs> like, draw a body. No one's falling for it. Like, please draw the human body. Um, because you're a character designer, not a face designer. Um, and so portraits are cool, but we also need to see you draw a whole body. 
and like see how comfortable you are playing with these proportions and you know uh putting costumes on these people that you're drawing or creatures that you're drawing um but you can't get too far <laughs> just drawing faces <laughs> all day that's like the most common thing i've seen and i just feel like no one has ever said it um let's stop this <laughs> let's stop <laughs> um two things i want to touch on the first is you looking at portfolios like for for you I want to bring this back to you too when you were putting your portfolio out there previously um I mean yet yes you still are but what were those consistencies that you really had to focus on Mm. and that you continue to focus on now but something you really really had to work on in your journey gesture gesture was probably the most common one um because i would definitely have like the lighting the painting all that stuff and they always liked it but they're like oh yeah but you're not really selling selling the character to the best of his ability and i was so that was one of those things that i was like really stubborn on because i'm like dude if the design is there and the lighting is there and the tech you know all that stuff um i would be like why do i need to focus so much on gesture but i get it um, now, because sometimes that's the only difference. <laughs> sometimes there's a lot of, you know, usually your your designs are pitted up against multiple uh, people's work. And the one thing <laughs> that might make you angry is you sit there, you design this really cool thing and everything is so well thought out. And then someone else designs something where the gesture and the pose is really cool but there's like no design and then it gets picked over yours. And you're like, what, why? (laughs) Right. But it's one of those things where it's like, well, they sold the character way more than you did, you know? And so um, that was probably the thing that I struggled with the most. Um, One of the tactics that I would use though, oftentimes with my portfolio is I would go to an event of someone who I really, you know, admired or looked up to and I would ask them for a crit and I would not, show another person that portfolio um another professional artist especially until i addressed that crit um because i treat it like you would potions in a video game right you only have 10 um and you don't want to waste those so i would show my stuff to say like you know keikai kataki or whatever or john park and he says oh yeah like these are cool but you need to work on you know, your design sense, or you need to work on your gestures. I'm not going to show my portfolio again to have someone tell me the exact same thing, because now you just wasted that, that, uh, that opportunity to wow someone when you first meet them. Right. So by the time I got a chance to show my portfolio to like the Bobby Chews and stuff like that, I had already had so much criticism, um, on my portfolio, my work that by the time he said it, he was like, oh yeah, you're basically ready. And I was like, okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> right. And he gave me like, then he started to dive deep into the like very subtle things that would kind of pump the portfolio up. And then I was able to tackle those. So that's one of those cool things is that it becomes no longer focusing on the big picture. You're now focusing on the little things. Um, and those little things really kind of help bump you up because The more criticism you get, um, the more those voices are in the back of your head the whole time. And every time you're drawing, you're like, oh, the gesture is not right. Oh, the lighting isn't as good as it should be. Oh, this is way too warm. And you're like hearing these voices (laughs) as you're drawing. But as long as you're doing it a million times, I would like to lie and say you won't hear those voices. But I hear every single damn voice (laughs) that I've uh, heard coming up. So it's one of those things that I think it's a, it's a being resourceful is really important and taking advantage of the fact that if you are a student, take advantage of the fact that you're a student, because by the time you become a professional, it gets harder and harder to find criticism in the way that won't have you look in some type of way, honestly. And the second thing I wanted to bring up, because you were talking about understanding where artists can go as you're placing them for work too. One of your, one of your dang superpowers is doing just that. And I think that's a part of what makes you really one 
awesome to work with for starters, but two, really good at your job in identifying that potential because even with the different projects that we have on 9B or even elsewhere, it's like you see beyond what said artist is presenting and Mm -hmm. knowing these artists for their craft, but also for who they are as human beings and how they tick beyond just their artwork um, Mm -hmm. really helps them grow. And I've definitely seen you do that in in ways that help artists grow and just want to give you props for that, man, because I think that's pretty cool. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think like something that's always been bigger to me than just kind of getting a skill set is also like upgrading your eye as often as you could. I remember a teacher kind of told me this really, really early in art school where he said like your eye and your skill set will constantly be competing. And as you build up your skill, your eye gets better. And then your eye, you'll look back at your work and you're like, man, this sucks. <laughs> and then you have to go and build up your skill set to pass your eye. And then your eye just keeps on, your eye and your skill keep doing this like dance of toppling each other. And so um, I know I would oftentimes try and find ways of improving my eye a lot when it comes to that and just recognizing like, seeing the potential in other people and seeing more than what they are showing, but almost what they're not showing um, and kind of recognizing like, Oh, this person would be really good for this. If he just, or she just had this opportunity. Um, Cause I felt like that was one of my frustrations definitely getting into the industry was someone would say <laughs> something as ridiculous as like, well, this is cool. This fantasy portfolio is cool, but you don't have a, elf riding a dragon with you know dark armor on so i don't know if you can do that and i'm like but i have an elf i have another character wearing dark armor and i have a dragon in my portfolio and you just think that because they're not put together in one that i can't do it right <laughs> um, it's like one of the most annoying like type of things is like some people want to see everything spelled out but i really like the old school like 1940s 1950s way of thinking when it came to um, reviewing artists which was most of the artists who worked for Disney a long time ago even up until like Aladdin most of those artists were not animation artists they were fine artists and if you looked at portfolios back then the way you do now we would have none of this cool Disney stuff that we've got to enjoy over the years. We would have none of the cool like 90s movies like Blade or 80s and 90s movies like Blade Runner where, you know, certain artists who were not really um, specializing in those things or even aliens. Like it was H.R. Geiger Geiger, who did those aliens and he's a fine artist. He's not a creature designer, right? And a lot of influence from like people like Bikinski who is another fine artist, not a creature designer, you know? So it's like, a lot of these things don't really have to be spelled out, but I feel like a lot of companies want to see these things spelled out. And oftentimes all it really is, is giving people opportunity and then they'll shine. You know, someone will look at someone's portfolio and say like, Oh yeah, that's more video games, not animation. Well, there's not much of a difference depending on that style that uh, the video game style that you're looking for. Tell them, tell that very same person to do something in animation. And then you have spider verse right? Most of those artists were not animation artists. They were video game artists. So I think just being open and kind of seeing things past the name, seeing things past the cool projects they've worked on and just literally looking at it for what it actually is, is super important in finding new talent, especially. Um, Obviously, you want them to give you something, right? But you don't want to depend on them designing an elf in dark armor or riding a dragon to you know depict that they can actually do that exact thing sorry for that rant but (laughs) not not at all you bring up a really important a really important um thing because when you're talking about the core like kind of the core principles and the skill set of what it takes to be an artist it it's very relatable in a production sense because the foundations are very similar, 
um, not not for those two respective crafts, but like a foundation for an artist in in say games or segueing that over to film. Like they they are they can be pretty similar, um, very much so in production. If you're a producer in video games and you're a producer in film or TV, the core foundation of what a producer does, for instance, you are a professional organizer. You learn how to organize schedules at scale. Um, but the other, those other skills that you learn, a lot of it, you learn on the job. So whether you're an artist transitioning from, hey, I'm in games and then I'm working in animation or same thing with production, it's definitely getting that shot that makes all the difference. But the, a lot of times in our respective industries too, you hear a lot of like, well, you don't have enough experience. Well, you haven't worked in this space long enough, which equates to you haven't had enough experience. But like, it's like, dog, how am I gonna get, gonna get the experience if you don't give me a shot? Like that is it. Like, yeah. it's like, okay, cool. But I've gotten to, this person has gotten to where they are because they have those other core skills and potential that have helped them get there. Um, right. So I think that's where a lot of companies make that mistake because right. they won't invest or take that risk. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. And I, and like I said, I still think like, yes, you have to give them something to riff off of. Right. But like, ultimately it just doesn't have to be so one-to-one. -one. Like if someone is showcasing a certain skill set and they're really damn good at it, you can really just like redirect them. Sometimes I think what people think they specialize in, it's not actually their specialty. <laughs> um, and I've seen that happen a lot too, where someone is like, yeah, like, I think I'm an environment guy. And then you put them on like cool characters and they're like killing it. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> you know? So I think that that's something to also kind of be mindful about too, is like, you know, just rec recognizing the potential. Like um, that's part of what 9B is about. And I think that like Phil like kind of describes that a lot where he says like, you know, oftentimes people will kind of recognize your experience, but not recognize the potential. And that's really harmful um, to allowing new talent in, in general. Um, and that's something that we really want to like showcase is like showing how well that actually works and how lazy recruiting is actually a hindrance to the industry as a whole. Um, because we'll look at films, we'll look at these um, cool games and we'll start to recognize that every single design looks the same um, time and time again. And it's not just because of Hollywood, it's also because of the art directors recruiting these artists, you know, like it, every artist has a language. And if you keep using the same language to try to make new words, you're only gonna get so many different words, right? So why don't you just take a completely new language and kind of, let that kind of flow into the industry and create something brand new. And then there you go, you get to riff off of that for another 10 years, you know? So I think that that's one of the big things that we've been doing and has been pretty successful the, um, so far with creating things that look super different. Um, and, you know, also understanding that people from different regions um, create different things, right? Like a lot of times we've seen a lot of African artists who've been killing it on Instagram and then you don't see them actually getting cool jobs. But when you look at some of the styles that they're presenting, it looked like nothing that we've seen before. It's kind of a hodgepodge of, you know, French artists and Japanese artists and cool things that we recognize, but it's with their own little twist. And because of that, they come up with just something that looks a little bit different. Their design aesthetic based on where they come from um, also feeds into that and it looks different. Um, so, I don't know. I think that that's one of the big things that uh, 9B has been doing and has been working really well for us is just making sure that we spend time really understanding the artists who we're talking to, um, kind of recognizing their, I guess, their the weaknesses and rec recognizing their strengths um, and not allowing someone else to kind of 
help us understand what that is, but us understanding what it is as a whole, um, at not just face value, but diving deeper into those things. Yeah, those values are really intertwined into the foundation of 9B. And while we continue building the company, it's, it's something continuously go back on as we're moving forward. Um, I'm also gonna read a few of the comments that are in this chat, mainly because people have been chiming in. Um, let's see. Yeah, Mike dropping gems, yes. Reggie said, yo, that's so, so good, Mike. Every sure. time I talk to Mike, give a talk, I learn new things. <laughs> TIL, what does TIL stand for again? Who? What's the acronym TIL? Oh, geez. It's not like you know, I'm worse at acronyms than anyone in the world. TIL. Most of yeah. the I know. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. I thought I knew what that meant. Um, okay. Yeah. Piper also says that your rant is really important because artists are multifaceted and nuanced. Yo, what up, Piper? Oh, thank you. Well, today I learned what TIL meant, means. It means today I learned. <laughs> I would not have guessed that. <laughs> oh my gosh, thank you. Wow, wow. Like, Everyone is like having me on the chat. <laughs> <laughs> like new information no why what like i was like nah, if no. nobody i was gonna like urban dictionary that so that we would yeah. learn something cool 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 um y'all we have about a we have a, like less than five minutes left um yeah. this yeah this <laughs> went by really quickly but um if there are any questions that y'all I would probably get in one or two more questions for now. If there's anything you want to ask, please ask it away. Um, but in the meantime, too, while we have a few minutes left, Mike, why don't we talk about what we have on this beautiful Magma Studio canvas right here? Yeah, so. Look at everyone's beautiful work. Yeah, everyone's so good. <laughs> yeah. Making me look bad. Um, but yeah, no, I love it at all. Uh, like I said, like Reggie just threw, drew like a million and one things at the same damn time. I feel like he just could fill this up on his own. I'm like loving this like funny bird here. And I'm like trying to draw like this goofy ass elf on top of it, uh, riding like a horse. Uh, oh man, someone's actually drawing chickens. I definitely should have done that. This is a missed opportunity. Oh man, it's okay. I got a little tiny chicklet for you. Also, good job, Christopher, with changing changing that the layer color. That was just like beautiful palette cleanse, like beautiful palette game changer right here. Um, but yeah, wait, our folks, folks, why are you deleting your stuff? Okay, don't delete. Yeah, where would it go? I just looked away for a second, and like stuff is gone. <laughs> They're like, don't look at me. Don't look at me. Um, but yeah, I'm like laughing at some of these because they're like so funny, so good. Like this mouse one over here. Oh, these are so, yeah, I love these. This cat, cat. So I kind of talked about this before, but like appreciating other styles that may not be your own, um, is super important to improving your taste. Um, I think like when... I say this a lot, but it's really true that what <laughs> Reggie is tripping. Um, whenever people think that most of these things are isolated, but nothing's really ever isolated, meaning whatever you are in one thing, you are in another, right? So like, even if it comes down to your taste in food, like those things really help <laughs> with your art as well, right? So like understanding that like, okay, you may love to draw anime, or whatever but you still that doesn't mean that you still can't appreciate uh some other forms of fine art or concept art or um even things like sculpting or even things as far as like theater um and understanding what is just simply good and that's kind of what taste is right it's like just literally recognizing what is good and it doesn't mean that you have to be so 
narrow-minded to only focus on what you specialize in because that's very limiting. And a lot of these things are limited to an era. So if, you know, say for example, you love drawing like Disney style, that's cool, but also recognizing that like that is a style, right? And just because you are doing that style doesn't mean that all of your work will come from that style. Um, and a lot of the thing that things that will help you get good um, and also allow yourself to get more work is a pre knowing what is good in other styles and learning how to appreciate them. Um, that's something I've kind of seen a lot, especially in school. Um, people just kind of focus on one thing. And then when that thing falls out of favor, there's nothing for it to fall back on. It's almost like you're learning a whole new skill set. When in fact, learning to get good at one thing really doesn't form the thing that you're good at, period. You know, so like, I think Piper is a good example. Like when I look at her work, it's like, yeah, her work is also good for animation, but it also could be fine art. You know what I mean? And like, it looks really cool. Like it looks cool as a standalone piece, but then you can also be like, oh, I could really see like a cool animated Disney project, or I could see a children's book with that. Or I can see, you know, like there's like range and you can tell that she's simply an appreciator of art, not just one genre. Um, and even some of your favorite artists who have been concept artists or even original like anime um, artists, they usually come from a school of understanding the arts and then they simplify their style down for the task. So I don't know where that came from, but I just felt like I needed to say it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's important. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm just trying to, I think Pi, like Piper's so stoked because I'm like, you're giving her all this good feedback and her work is so incredible. So I'm just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> um, all, all good things. And Piper's work is incredibly awesome. Um, we are just about out of time, but we have one final question. And I think that Jeff would be very upset if we didn't ask it. So- oh, no. <laughs> uh, okay it's okay it's okay because it's gonna go back and forth so jeff asked mike what's your favorite thing about christina christina same question um that's a good question that's an easy question for me though so finally i get an easy easy question um i think there's a lot of dope things about christina but my favorite thing about christina is christina is raw as hell like christina is like so forward and honest that you will know exactly how she feels when she feels it, but in a good way. Um, she knows how to really communicate her feelings. She also knows how to really work well with others. She knows how to be a self-starter. Um, all things that are like really important, not just for working relationships, but also just friendships in general. Um, she knows how to read the room. She knows how to really um, understand the people around her and like kind of work around the things that they may lack. Um, and I think that, and also she's like, just super helpful in general. <laughs> like if I had to tell you guys how many times she's like saved my organ, my lack of organization life, uh, you probably wouldn't even believe me, but yeah, she's a badass friend, but even cool to work with, um, period. Like, yeah, wherever she goes, I go. <laughs> oh, damn. Oh, thank you so much. Oh my goodness. Um, you kind of took one that was very similar to mine. So I'm going to change what I have to say about you. But one of my favorite things about you is how much you care for others. And that sounds super cheesy, but a lot of the reason, like a lot of the way you move is in how you give back and like where you go, you bring people with you especially when they put in the work, like you never, you never leave your tribe behind. You build your tribe, your tribe continues to build others and together everyone moves forward. Like we all, we all move and climb together and it's such a joy to work with you and to have been able to get to know you as a friend but, and as a human being, but also as like an athlete and an artist and all those things. It's such a joy to see how you've grown as a person but more importantly, how you've also grown as an artist and an art director. 
and seeing the way people light up around you when you bring them with you is just so next level because the way you move and how you provide feedback, how you help others grow and just even dropping snippets of knowledge during talks like this or in behind in rooms behind closed doors, people can feel that energy from you and you build off of that energy. You, you gather the energy from those around you, but you share it. Like you don't, you don't hog that for yourself. You always give back to others so that we can continue doing this work that we do. Really appreciate that. You almost made me blush, but I was like, Oh my gosh. (laughs) Thank you. I really appreciate that though. For real, for real. But yeah, we are. So go ahead. I was saying, what's up, Jeff? You handsome beast. You. Man Crush Tuesdays. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we are very much out of time. And in just a few seconds, I'm going to toss it back to the Wacom team over in Portland. However, thank you so much to everyone that joined us on the YouTube stream uh, at the Wacom Experience Center in drawing today. Everyone who's drawn, asked a question, or even chimed in on the chat, we truly, truly appreciate you lending us your time today and spending time with us. Um, And for, for those of you who are on social media, you can follow us on Instagram at 9B Collective. That is 9B Collective, C-O-L-L-E-C-T-I-V-E. Once again, thank you so much to the team at Magma Studio for providing this wonderful canvas for us and to the Wacom team in both Portland and Japan. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it back to Megan. Thanks everyone. Thank you. (laughs) I'm just laughing at Reggie's amazing work. (laughs) He's like, wait. (laughs) 